And uh, it's nice to meet you guys. I met a few of you. Uh, uh, I met a few of you last evening, and uh, um, talked to the, the Nike guys. So prep, prep myself on some of the slides. Um, I uh, I thought I'd talk to you today about. Obviously the store and the store experience, but sort of connecting it to this new thing that everybody seems to be talking about, which is the internet of, of everything, which, which started with the internet of, of things, I call it the internet of stuff, but it's, it's that, that wonderful world that goes beyond mobile. And so we're going to be talking about that a bit today. And, and you know, I'm happy for, to have you interrupt me, um, you know, throw questions, make this a little bit more iterative. Uh, I, I know that, that uh, you guys are, are, are part of the uh, Location-Based Marketing Association and I'm a director of it uh, with the CIF. Uh, CIF. Mm -hmm. the, the mandate there is to understand the mobile consumer and, and with mobility, and I've been in, in mobility for, uh, oh my gosh, you know, 12, 13 years. I, I launched the first cross-carrier short code campaign in North America. And, and so, so understanding the narrative of your consumer from the time they wake up in the morning to the time they go to bed at night is sort of essential for mobility. It's the definition of mobility because you know your 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 new consumer is mobile, and and so understanding where they wake up in the morning, what screen they're on, how they navigate through the day in this multi-screen economy, all the way through you know to the evening hours is essential in understanding how you're going to intercept them. And, and intercepting, you know, uh, grabbing, you know, their intent, making sure that they don't abandon that intent and sort of go, you know, for the Hail Mary and conversion is essential to everybody's business, right? And, um, and we know that one third of digital media spend is allocated to cross media campaigns, cross device campaigns. So combining these different screens into one campaign is essential and is increasing yearly. And, and that increase is, is driving huge ROI for the brands that get it. Because connecting the screens is, again, making sure that that brand, uh, that that consumer engages with your brand intelligently if they, if they have an intent to buy, that there's no chance that, that there's going to be uh, a, a, a moment that you give to them uh, to abandon that intent, that there's any interruption, there's any friction in the, their decision to go through with the purchase. And, and the closer you can connect the screen experiences, the closer you are to driving that conversion, wherever it may be, whether it be in the cloud, whether it be in the bricks and mortar, whether it be into a catalog, um, into a recommendation to a friend, so we all talk about, oh my gosh, wasn't it a whole lot easier in the old days, right? You know, and, and the new world is a lot more complicated. And, and that's, that's a, you know, a theme that I see at all conferences, at all panels. Oh my gosh, it's a lot more complicated with mobile. But really, if you consider the, mo the mobile consumer, Really, it's the consumer that's complicated. And really what mobility has done is it ex has ex exposed the complexity of our consumer and given them some tools to, to do what they really wanted to do from you know, day one. This was a narrative that we put together in a very simplistic way, you know, based on shopper insights and based on our you know, shopper marketing folk. I don't know if the world was ever that simple. So really, what we're doing today is facing the reality of our consumer and becoming more intimate to their needs, understanding how to, to, to work with them throughout the day on their devices, empowering them you know, to, to really understand us as brands and, and engage with us intelligently. So the, the crux to this in the mobile world is, and you've all seen, you know, uh, meet fuckers, right? And remember that scene in the morning when he's sort of, he's lying in bed and he finds that piece of paper on, on, uh, on his chest and it says, uh, you know, circle of trust and you're not in it, <laughs> right? And, and the challenge we face is, is that the mobile phone or the mobile universe or this device that our consumer has is, is a very, very close and intimate screen, right? And there's a lot of trust involved there. You only let a certain amount of folk onto your screen. 
especially if it's an intimate relationship, like a text message relationship with something you know, like a, a, something like uh, letting somebody into your social network, you're only going to let a few folk in. And the reality is, is that most of our, the brands in our consumer's life are out of that circle. And, and so this is our strategy. This is our big data strategy. It's a scientific sort of, oh my gosh, I've got to create the super app to engage with, with my complex scientific exercise of, of, of intercepting my consumer, right? So we have this science project going on with mobility. And, and the reality is, is, is that mobility is more like this. It's more like a, you know, understanding and, and having a, a warm and loving relationship with your customer. But we still think that it's a technology pursuit. And that is really, I think, one of the fundamental problems we have in mobility today is, is that because the mobile device is, is such a, a powerful device that we think that the apps and the solutions that we build around it have to be super complex, right? This is what, how much faster than the first rocket, the, you know, the, 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 the computer that sent the first rocket to the moon? A lot. A lot. <laughs> All right. It's 3,000 plus, 3,000 times faster. And, and, and so we think that everything we need to build for, for this device has to be you know, super fast, super complex. But really, it's this that we have to focus on, which is really what we needed to focus on 100 years ago in retail which is developing a relationship with your customer, developing trust, you know their name when they come in, there's a sort of clientele in a warm atmosphere and you're driving conversion. So I was just actually last week in Paris and I took this photo um, which of the Mona Lisa. And, and it's, it's fascinating because nobody's looking at the Mona Lisa, right? <laughs> nobody's looking at the Mona Lisa. And if, if, if you actually notice, uh, the room that Mona Lisa is in, uh, the actual, the, the, the great da Vinci's are in the corridor. You know, in the corridor on the way out. And there's always marketing around this one picture. So everybody's crowding around there. And what do they do? They turn around. And it, it's amazing. Like everybody, they either take a, 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 a picture and then they'll turn their back and then they'll do a selfie. And, and this is the problem with brands, is that that's you as a brand. And your consumers turn their back to you and they're interacting with you through a screen. And you're not part of that screen narrative. In most cases, if somebody does a selfie, you're not seeing the screen at all. You're seeing the back of the screen. So how do you get onto the screen? How do you get into a trust relationship where you can be part of that picture? So, you know, the crux of the matter is how you connect with this mobile consumer. And, and, and so I'll go back in time. I, I like to start at, at Bill um, in my presentations. So this is Comdex uh, 2001, I think, uh, the now defunct Comdex show in, in, in Vegas. And, and he's launching this, this tablet. Remember the tablet PC? Oh, and, 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 and you know his big mantra was, oh, it's super cool. Oh, all our developers are taking it home. It must be just hot. They're all excited. Um, they started shipping this unit. It, it shipped for, uh, I think, two quarters. I think they sold maybe 100, 150,000 units, or maybe that's as many as they shipped. I don't know if they were actually sold. But it was, it was the evolution of Microsoft's, uh, you know, you know, plan uh, of uh, how to take their product forward. And, and this evolution obviously fell flat because this device really never connected to the consumer. There was no warmth. This was a science project, right? And this guy came uh, onto the scene a few years later with, with the iPhone and obviously huge connection. Right? We, 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 we managed to connect to this in a very human way. This was not the science project. Actually, there was no science involved in here at all. If you, if you know the technology behind the iPhone, th there was very little new to the actual iPhone from a technology perspective. It was really all about understanding how the consumer interfaced with that technology. This was compactive touch, right? Pinch and zoom. And pinch and zoom technology, compactive touch, had been around from a, a patent that, that Andrew Shu put together in, in, what was it, I think it was uh, 1999. And, uh, and so the technology was there. Actually, Prada launched the, uh, an LG uh, phone, the Prada phone, the year before, with compactive touch, beautiful design. So from that perspective, design, everything, it, it would be in the market. But what this guy did is he allowed you to feel that you could actually jump into data and explore data in a very human way. 
right? So from the, 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 you know, the science project to the, the, the big bear hug, right? This was the big bear hug, right? And it allowed you to, to feel that you had a connection to this technology. And because of that, you have all these wonderful lines all around the world with people lining up for the iPhone or, or, or technology that emulated that user interface, like Samsung here. Um, and, and there was a delight, right? I mean, this guy really delighted his customers, right? You, you, you were lining up, you were jumping for joy to have the first iPad. Um, this was a phenomenal. Uh, what kind of brand uh, affinity uh, can you inspire, uh, you know, through, through just one interface, the one ability to jump forward from an evolution to what this is, which is really a revolution, right? And, and, and really it's because he understood that technology, again, was about having that, that touch, having that hug, uh, that embrace. And so this is a quote by Don Norman, you know, touch is a very important sense. We know that, right? All our emotion and, and how we interact with people is based on it. And, and we lost something really big when we went to the abstraction of the computer with a mouse and a keyboard. It wasn't real. And what did, what did the, uh, the PC, the, the tablet PC do to interface? How did you interface with it? Do you recall? Digitized. With a? Digitized. Yeah, with the, with the little stylus, right? Uh, yeah. And, uh, and what, did, what did Steve Jobs say about styluses? If you've read the biography, he said, we're born of five, right? And, and so, so it wasn't real. There was an intermediary. Yeah. And, and, and swiping your hand across the page is more intimate. It's not, it, 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 think of it not as a swipe, but think of it as a caress. So again, don't think of it as technology. Think of it as just the human interface. I always say, you know, like, if you can go into a bar and meet somebody and, and get their phone number and go on a date and, and, and get into a relationship and get married and have babies, not necessarily in that order, then, you're, then you understand the human project of meeting people and, and establishing trust. Right? So we then got into the, 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 the retail project of meeting our customers and we forget that. Yeah, not all of us, but it, some of us forget that really it's, it's not a technology project, it, it's a human project, but it's really hard and not scalable to go and hu bear hug each of our consumers out there, our loyalists. So we have to work out a way of digitally doing that. So, and, and the challenge is, is you have this guy who I always like to bring up because he wrote a book called Civilization is Discontents, which would be a good, good name for mobility. Um, and, and, and Sigmund, around 1903, wrote a book, and in that book, uh, he's, he made the following quote. He basically said, man has become a prosthetic god. And what he meant by that is that we, we like to make ourselves bigger than we are. And in order to make us bigger than we are, we put things on us that allow us to be a lot more powerful, right? Uh, spears and cars and you know, wigs and whatnot. And, uh, and so man has become a kind of prosthetic god. When he puts on all these kind of auxiliary organs, he is truly magnificent, but those things have not grown onto him uh, in, in a natural way, right? And they still give him much trouble, right? So, so these, these things that we attach to ourselves, which allow us to interface to data and, and in weird ways, aren't necessarily always optimized for that consumer. They're still a little clunky, right? And if it's not seamless, then you're interrupting that bear hug. You're interrupting the data bear hug. So go back to maps. Uh, <laughs> um, so I collect maps. And uh, that unfortunately, this is a map that I, I do not own. But this is uh, John Ogilvy. Uh, John Ogilvy, um, uh, about 1670s odd, came up with this concept of maps. And up until that point, maps had been, you know, the usual sort of, here is London, you know, here is Land's End, uh, here is, you know, a space between the two. And you'd have to get the different maps and you have to connect them. He said, no, 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 hold on a second. The consumer doesn't interact with uh, maps that way. They buy a map because they want to go from point A to point B. So why are we giving them this, this map that they have to crinkle and fold? And we say, if you want to go from point A from point B, I'm just going to give you this strip that allows you to go from point A to point B. Strip maps, right? Revolution. This was the revolution in, you know, since, since uh, Galileo, you hadn't had such a revolution in, 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 in the understanding of maps and understanding of space. 
Here, you had strip maps, uh, this one going from, from London to Land's End, where even in the map, you had points of interest, you had distances, you had turnoffs. you know, you knew where to get the next bundle of hay for your horse. I mean, this was the modern map. <laughs> And so if you look at the history of maps, you have, you know, good old Ogilvy time, you know, the eight, uh, 1680s or whatnot. This guy, you know, picked up his Ogilvy map, he put it on the seat next to him, and he's happy as a clam going from London to Land's End. And then, hey, speed forward to a roadster in the 60s, you know, same thing. I go to the gas station, I pick up a strip map, right? And, and then, you know, a contemporary sedan, and oh, I'm going to my, um, my, my, my laptop, and I'm printing out a bespoke, you know, point A to point B on, on Google. Really, when you take a deep breath and you look at this, evolution, no revolution here from, you know, 1670 to contemporary, um, you know, paper maps. No real, ev you know, no, no real revolution. It's just, hey, obviously there's efficiencies in printing and printing and here a little bit more personalization. Points of interest, pretty much the same thing. This was the revolution. Because now my data was dynamic. And I could jump into data, I could take a turn off and stump dynamically off my personal screen, navigate left, navigate right. And things could dynamically show, and obviously more contemporary maps, I get deals and points of interest dynamically coming up. This was the revolution. And so what happened with this revolution, and I, and I love this shot because this is, uh, uh, this is back, uh, you know, a few years back when I just started out mobility, uh, when Benedict was announced at the Vatican, and everybody's lining up to say who, who's the next pope, and uh, looking for the smoke, and uh, right in the corner here, there's a, there's a phone, right? And I always like to ask folk, what's this guy doing? What's this guy doing? with his phone. What's he taking doing? Picture. He's taking a picture. He's not taking a picture. This is a Nokia 600. He's not taking a photograph. <laughs> yeah, this is a flip phone. What's he doing? Phone Honey, phone. I be late. He could be, yeah. he could be, he could be taking, make a phone call. Ah, it's a big crowd, it's noisy, he's text messaging, right? That's a primary function of this phone. A little bit of calling, a little bit of text messaging. That's it, and nothing else, right? Maybe a few hidden sort of, uh, you know, digital evangelists in there, right? But then you pedal forward to Francis, and it looks a whole lot different, right? Wow. Right, and, and here's the same, you know, Vatican Square. Unbelievable. And this revolution in screens is because screens became accessible. Not because they, they, they were necessarily smaller and they fit in your pocket and, and uh, you know, the Nokia did that. What, what happened here is that they became accessible from a human interface and they became things that we wanted to carry around with us as extensions of the way that we engage with the world. So these became prosthetic elements. They made us more powerful. And, and, and the, this is pretty much like the Mona Lisa because these guys aren't looking at the square. What they're doing is they are representatives of the social community. And they're taking pictures and videos and posting it back home, right? So this is the, you know, that guy was texting home to say, Mom, I'm going to be late. These guys are, are uh, you know, taking pictures and videos and, and, and blasting them all around the world. And, and so out of that revolution came the App Store. And, and I love what obviously Steve Jobs did, and, and I always I think he's a revolutionary in, in, in what he did around, you know, opening the, the phone and opening the screen uh, to the world. Uh, what he did after that, as most companies do that, that have a leadership position, is he created a walled garden around that, a business walled garden. And he said, you know, when Apple wakes up in the morning, what, what do they think about? What, what employees at Apple think about when they wake up in the morning? What do they want to do? What most people at Apple think about. They want to make money doing what? They want to make money selling phones, selling tablets, right? They don't give a hoot about the, the, uh, the App Store. They, I mean, that is not even rounding error as far as, as their, their uh, quarterly returns. What this does is it creates a wall garden around their products to say, buy our hardware. It comes with all this unbelievable software. And, and Apple's you know, marketing budget went into what? Their, their App Store SDK, their App Store SDK, 
and a few ads here and there, and then maybe a few legal battles with Samsung, right? Which is also their marketing budget, because they know they're not going to do anything with a win, but it's just to say, hey, we were the first, right? Apple's a marketing genius, and the App Store was a marketing, you know, to the, a marketing wonder because everybody in their garage all around the world started developing bespoke stuff so that you would buy uh, an Apple phone. And, and the other folks followed their lead, right? So you had Samsung and others, Android with an app store. And, and the, the challenge with this is the, the phone, the smartphone turned into what I call a, a Cracker Jack container. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, you, you like Cracker Jack, right? You, you jump into the box, it's got all that caramel of the, 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 the popcorn and you're plowing to the bottom, because at the bottom, there's a joke and a bit of bubble gum and maybe a plastic ring, right? And those are the apps on our phone. We download all this stuff so that we can at Starbucks say, hey, did you see this cool? Did you try, oh, look. Oh my God, that's so, oh, I gotta get that. How do I download that? What's that name, right? And it's all the Cracker Jack stuff at the bottom. And, and it turned our smartphone into smart as a pejorative term. Oh, it's so smart, it's precocious. It's cool, you know? But it's not really intelligent. And, and what I'm excited about is how the mobile phone is going to change the world again. And we're at that point right now where the phone is about to change the world again. And because the phone is not as much an end in and of itself, but the phone is now a device that connects intelligently to the world around us. And of course, there are lots of apps that leverage these external sensors. But the big thing is the fact that it can now connect to other networks. And, and because it can connect and talk to other things around us intelligently, those things can talk back. And that is the birth of the internet, of everything. And this guy, John Chambers, the head of Cisco, uh, he, he talks about the internet of everything. He's also fairly good at marketing because it used to be the internet of things until he came around. And, and, but, but basically what he says is the internet of things is the internet of stuff. So I can, I can make this cup talk to me and I can make a Nike shoe talk and I can make you know, um, any one of your products interact in some way that makes it smart. But, but really what powers all that is the, the, the social glue, the, the software, the things that make that, those things with my phone work intelligently. And that's what he calls the internet of everything. And that software will absolutely change the way that we interact with the world and, and deliver huge amount of new income and revenue and opportunity into the world. He talks about 19 trillion dollars. I don't exactly know where he gets his math, but it's probably a big number. Okay? There's a lot of opportunity in reinventing the world around us, right? And, and we know that because the phone has limitations, right? We know the phone from a downloadable app perspective was cool, but now it doesn't do everything I need it to, especially if it's an iPhone and it, and it, does, and it has that walled garden around it. Uh, so now I, I do things like, wow, I can shove things into the audio jack and I can extend functionality. Who would have thunk, right? And so suddenly my audio jack becomes my payment delivery uh, portal. Um, but it's, it's, it's the world that I'm gonna talk about that is beyond the audio jack, right? So, so you have all these wonderful tools that plugged into the audio jack. You know, uh, you, you could point, uh, obviously, uh, laser pointers all the way through to uh, breath analyzers so you can keep in your purse and check out, you know, if, if, if you had a late night last night and, and, and didn't wanna drive. Um, if you really had a bad night last night and you didn't want to drive, you may want to have one of these, which is a thermometer, and uh, you can plug that into your phone as well. And then if it was really a dr draconian night, you may want one of these little Geiger meter. But the, the bottom line is you can plug anything into the audio jack and, and give fu additional functionality. But it's kind of clunky if you think about it. it you know, this idea of, of, of attaching sort of Lego blocks to a device that just wasn't really, it, it didn't facilitate it, so you're sort of plugging things in. Is is a good intermediary sort of stage, but it is, it is clunky. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's definitely not the Steve Jobs sort of elegant interface, right? And uh, ironically, 
you know, created because Steve Jobs didn't want to put you know seamless ports into his phone. But uh, but the the bottom line is we have a world where uh, there are 10 billion connected objects in the world, things out there that talk to us, right? And you know, that number's gonna rise. You know, 50 billion, who knows? It's a big number. It's like the, the 19 trillion dollars, right? There are a lot of things out there that are gonna be connected. I would hazard a guess that all the shoes that you guys create in this room will be connected, for example. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, shoes are connected. Your plants now can talk to you and say, give me some water, give me some love. Uh, your, your kids can tell you that, hey, <laughs> Tweet. <laughs> um, obviously, this is the big news th this past year, which is uh, Google's acquisition of Nest, uh, which is really uh, a howling call for uh, an expansion into the Internet of Everything. I think Google is going to be a huge proponent of this market. Um, and, uh, and, and all the way through to things like, like bras that have EKGs embedded in them so that you can calibrate yourself so that it will tell you on your phone when you're about to have a snack attack. Yeah, patent, but you know, obviously trying to head in that, those kind of directions. So, but, but the world has always been trying to talk to us. It just had never had a voice, right? So you had basketballs that knew that your, your game sucked but could never tell you, right? <laughs> now, they can tell you, and they can tell your coach, and they can, they can tweak your game. And so, so suddenly, everything around you has an intelligence and can talk to you. They always had the data. Things always had the data. They just never had the internet of everything to connect that data to you. So, and, and the big place where we know that the internet of everything is, is, is starting out is the home, because that's a natural place to, to sort of grow uh, your footprint. Um, you know, you have, you know, keys to open your door. We were talking last night about, you know, uh, the same sort of apps that open the lock of your bike. Um, and it's a natural thing, right? The, the, the only challenge here is how do we make that seamless? How do we make it so that it's, again, um, a, a seamless prosthetic? So if I'm going from an app um, that, that I download and lose into one of my folders, uh, is that not basically emulating the real life where I downloaded an app to open the door to my house and then I lose the app in one of my folders, is that not similar to losing your keys in your purse? I mean, we have to get to a point where this is great, but how do we make it seamless? How do we make it so that we, it's a seamless extension of ourselves as we go forward? Obviously, mood lights and, and, and being able to turn lights on and off based on, 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 on the weather, on, on temperature. Uh, I'll tell you a story later on about you know, how uh, there's, a, there's a company called Digital Imp started because the founder of Digital Imp had lights in his bathroom that change color based on the stock market. So that's kind of scary, right? Suddenly you're taking a shower and the whole bathroom turns red. And it's like, ah! <laughs> you know. Um, and, but look, we've always wanted to communicate to things. So when I'm, uh, when I'm at home and it's 12 o'clock and I text my daughter and I say, you know, where are you? And she says, oh, I'm around the, you know, I'm, I'll be home in half an hour, Dad. And I say, okay, fine, please let me know when you're in, right? I have a human communication with her, right? And then I need to change the cycle of my washing machine. I have to go down to the basement, I have to turn a knob. I mean, what is that? <laughs> and, and so why, why can't we have a human relationship with, with the things around us? And why can't that be seamless and not lost, but a narrative, just like the way we talk to people, the way we, we tell people we're going to meet them at a certain place and have a coffee and how you're doing and how's your day going. The washing machine can say, well, you asked me to, to, to turn on it at nine, but you never told me if you wanted it hot or cold. Oh, hot. Thanks so much. Right? So, um, and we know that this is going to change shopping, right? So you, you know you have the Amazon Dash that's being piloted right now, um, you know, to basically allow people to, you know, uh, to, to navigate their pantry seamlessly, uh, to be able to audio uh, uh, in uh, to Dash uh, their shopping list uh, and, and go out seamlessly and, and buy that stuff online. Uh, we know that shoes uh, have been reinvented over the last the past few years. This is um, uh, individual Shwam, uh, a, a grad uh, of MIT who developed a shoe in India uh, for uh, the um, 
uh, um, uh, people who are uh, visually challenged. And um, it, it started out as obviously a garage project, evolved into something that you know was w could be inputted into the shoe to allow for uh, haptic navigation uh, of somebody who is blind, um, and and then have that actually integrated into the shoe so that if um, you put this proximity sensor, it connected to your phone, you now could tell your phone, hey, I need to get to the first Canadian place, and it would now relay information uh, from the, the you know, Google Maps to the shoe to say, you know, turn left, turn right, vibrate to the left, vibrate to the right, and had image uh, uh, sensors in front to, to make sure that if there were potholes and other things that weren't on the map, that it would inform you haptically. And so now it's been refined into an insole. Pretty powerful stuff. And, and so these are all extensions of of wearables that, that allow us to create a more intelligent experience with this device, which is no longer a smartphone, it's more of an intelligent server. Right? And so uh, we, we know that these kind of functions uh, are everywhere. Uh, the most prosaic type would be just putting stuff on our luggage to make sure that we don't lose it, our, our, um, you know, putting it on our bags, on our wallets, uh, you know, putting sensors on our kids' shoes to make sure we can track them. And then you know, not only can you track them because you can, uh, you're within range of the particular sensor, but you create a, a network of sensors so that even if you're not in range, somebody else on the network in range, so you can basically track uh, that person beyond uh, y y your your broadcast uh, or, or, or uh, receptor range. Um, you know, everything from rings that allow you to sign things in the air and all that stuff now interfaces back to the phone uh, through to uh, putting stuff on your dog uh, so that you can track them like Whisper. Uh, and. And then sensible baby. Um, I don't know how, how many of you have kids, but uh, you know, in, in my day, uh, we had the, the little baby monitors, right? Uh, the ones going. And then that's all gone because now I can put something on uh, the ki the kid's uh, ankle, and it tells me in an intelligent way: are they on their back? Are they on their front? How much they've moved? This creates a whole new world, and it also. All of those incumbent technologies are out the door unless they've adapted to the new realities of a connected uh, world. Um, hey, uh, two intelligent lighters that help you uh, quit smoking because it is now telling you how many times you lit up and informing you and recording that and maybe relaying that back to your doctor uh, through to obviously um, you know putting contact lenses in to check your glucose level. Uh, all of these things are so powerful and medicine is, is profoundly changing. Here you have uh, an ultrasound. This is an ultrasound. You know how much an ultrasound costs? Uh, the big one. A lot. <laughs> it's 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 a, well, it's, it's between thirty and fifty thousand dollars for those units, right? And so, kind of hard. Uh, they're heavy, right? They they expensive. Um, here you have a unit that that is uh, handheld, right? Plugging into a. Um, a Microsoft uh, uh, phone because they're the only ones that have the fast output to allow for the, the image uh, visualization. But uh, you can now take this into a rural village in Africa and have that data transmitted to an expert at Stanford. I mean, that's unbelievable. And uh, and then pills that tell you how much how many pills you've taken relays that data back to your doctor. Um, you know, through to again glucose uh, uh, um, uh, monitors, intelligent fibers, tattoos, the skin patches. You know, toilet analysis. Your whole world now can become uh, the 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 healthcare uh, worker who's monitoring you and telling uh, your your physician what they need to know and and creating the intelligent alerts for you. This is a whole new world. And uh, even all the way through to, to, to products that will be on the shelf. Look, and uh, I would say that it's probably the worst product to, to demo uh, a sensor on. This is an edible sensor uh, because uh, as far as I know, uh, bananas can tell you when they need to be thrown out. But, uh, but, but generally, I mean, that's not amazing. Suddenly you can walk around the store and say, you know what? The sensor is telling me that that, one, that particular product is not as fresh as it should be. Um, and then there's this, uh, this, this woman, uh, uh, Mrs. Wei, uh, who um, back in, I think it was 19, uh, no, 2007, she married her uh, PC, 
It was a big thing on BBC. It was, she's a, she's a, Brit, a British gal. And she, she married her PC. She said, look, you know, I have an intimate relationship with my PC. And uh, we've been together longer than most of my, my boyfriends. And so I'm going to officially marry my PC. And it was a, it was a legal battle, you know, whether she could actually uh, claim that she had a, a digital spouse. But, uh, it, but she also is a principal in a company uh, called Easy Vibe, uh, who, uh, Vibe Easy. Uh, which uh, is um, creates this particular product, which allows you and couples all around the world uh, to remotely have a very intimate relationship, right? And and so again, th this whole idea of connecting things in, in a very human way goes from food to shoes, through to keys, through to you know so your intimate moments, right? And uh, and and what's powering this economy and making it more seamless are guys like this. This is the digital imp guy who had the lights in his uh, bathroom, he was also involved with Nest in the early stages, uh, came, has come up with a chip which basically allows uh, developers to input this into their products and seamlessly uh, create you know, things like uh, d uh, uh, remotely dispensed gumball machines and things like that. So you shove it in there, it seamlessly talks to your phone, creates a pairing and allows you to do amazing things. And so the, the whole economy that is goes beyond uh, the the digital app store is 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 booming right now uh, you have you know you know going beyond apps you know going beyond downloading a, an app to open your door uh, to seamlessly putting those commands into your skin right so uh, to, to create tattoos that will interface um, to your phone. Um, there are a number of patents on the market. Uh, this one's an, an Nokia patent. Uh, this one's uh, a, a Motorola patent, uh, basically to allow you to keep the phone where it should be, which is in your pocket. So when a call comes in, your audio tattoo can interface uh, with the phone, and 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 you can talk. So so it, it really, where we're going is we went through the crackerjack crackerjack uh, phase. We're now getting into connecting from digital world to the physical world, but we still have this crackerjack mentality, right? So most of the apps that I've shown you still depend, most of these physical you know, manifestations on products still depend on downloading this app. What needs to happen is that there is a more seamless integration to your phone. So the phone is less of the smart device and more of, a, as I indicated, an intelligent server so that it knows your preferences. It knows what you like. So it doesn't have to it, it doesn't have to manually demand that you open an app to conduct a, a piece of business. It knows that it's Gary, that you have certain profile, and that when you come into the room, the lights will change, the heating changes, the music changes, your doors unlock. This is the world that we're moving into and the the, the company that nails that interface is going to be that next you know, Steve Jobs, the, the next sort of, you know, a guy who's going to delight us to allow us to connect not only to screens, but to the physical world in a seamless way. I mean, wouldn't that be powerful? And that is where we're moving. Uh, and if you look, uh, Total Recall, uh, if you look at this, this is a wall in an Apple store. And right now, it's a, it's a fairly small sliver. But this wall in the Apple Store is phy selling physical apps, right? So, you know, garage openers and, you know, light switches and obviously thermostats and, and, and thermostats and, and smoke detectors. I would hazard a guess that within a year, this is the full length of the Apple Store's wall, probably much to their chagrin, because again, this is more OTT, they don't control this as much, especially when these don't depend only on an app, but are embedded into the OS. And I would hazard a guess that Android is going in that direction. Uh, you know, they'll have interfaces which are seamless, that don't demand a, uh, a physical download, that allow you in your setup to program your house so that it's a one-time thing and, and you're off the races. Um, and so in our stores, we have the same thing. Uh, you know, there's the mobile location uh, analytics which allow us to map the journey of that consumer. We're pairing our systems with physical 
things out there which are the mobile phones of our consumers, right? And we can he heat map their journey through our stores. Um, they're, they're, as retailers, we have, for example, Wi-Fi networks. Right now, we use those networks just to uh, allow either B2B things to happen in our store, or in, in the case of a, some of our stores, we allow the consumer to jump onto the network, like in the Nike store. So. That's great, but the, the opportunity is now to create an Internet of Everything situation where you're not only going to these guys in the market to create analytics on top of that so that when you're coming in, just as we saw with the heat map, you can be tracked and you can anonymously know where your consumers are and that this particular MAC address came in yesterday and he comes in every Friday, you know, insights. And you know, there's only so much you can do with those insights. If you can take these MAC addresses and pair them to a personality. So go from anonymous map, um, you know, mapping of the MAC addresses and, uh, and to drive analytics to an opt-in where the consumer says, my MAC address is Gary, I like this, you know, I like to walk on the beaches on Friday nights and romantic dinners and buying Nike shoes. Then you can then create a loyalty relationship around them that is proximity based. And proximity engagement is the pillar of mobile because as we started with that journey, if you know where that consumer is and you can talk to them based on that moment of the day, you're going to intercept their intent in a much more intelligent way. So if I know that that person came into my store, jumped onto my Wi-Fi network and opted in uh, to communicate to Nike, and then the next week walks by a Nike store, maybe in that particular mall or in somewhere else in the US, I, if I got permission, I can talk to them. And just as you, you'll have uh, Abercrombie and Finch, you'll have somebody standing out there, probably without a shirt, but saying, hey, come on in. Right? Why can't you digitally reach out to people that are within a radius of your store to say, hey, come on in, let's drive some door swing. Because you know that if you get them into your store that they're going to buy something. Right? So, so a, again, not the science project of saying, oh my gosh, she's, she's in front of aisle 15, that shampoo, I'm going to send her a targeted, I'm going to do a bidding war between, you know, uh, P&G and uh, and you leave and we're going to bid for a deal. We're going to shoot it to that person. So they're going to go, oh my gosh, I'm going to buy. That's the science project of shopping. And that doesn't exist. What you want to do is say, hey, you know, if I could get that person into my store, they'll probably buy something. That's a good assumption. And I can tell you that works. And, and, I, and I know that if you can drive an opt-in and talk to somebody in a relevant, you know, marketing, you know, using your marketing savvy, um, engaging way, you can drive 30, at, at least 30% conversion into your store. That's pretty, pretty profound. And then you can, you know, uh, tie that to your uh, loyalty programs, etc. So, so it's, it's an exciting world because suddenly now these objects that you never had any relationship with now are animated and you can, can engage with them intelligently. And so really the exercise that I would say is in your future going forward is saying, look, mobility is about the connectivity to things outside of the mobile universe. And so we spent a whole bunch of time trying to understand how to be relevant on the screen now maybe we need to spend a whole bunch of time how to be relevant with our products, with our stores, with, with the, the people around us and the objects around us and, and create engaging relationships and interesting and intelligent relationships with the mobile devices out there. And that is going to be a multiplier of value. And, and as I call it, it's, it's um, understanding where the next revolution is, right? Which, which I think is this. And what is this? Velcro. It is digital Velcro. And this is Velcro, and it's what I really think you need to think about in your strategies, which is don't fixate on the screens. Because I think we, we do that too much. We say, oh my gosh, responsive design. Oh my god, I'm going to take my website, and it's going to be look so nice on the mobile phone. Look, I've got a mobile strategy. It's so pretty, right? Instead of only focus, I mean, of course, that's uh, you, you have to have that as part of the way that you look at the world. But that is, in and of itself, only a stepping stone to saying, how do I not only have a visual footprint on a phone, and it's a targeted uh, uh, layout based on what I presume they do on that mobile phone, as opposed to the tablet, as opposed to their PC, um, 
but also understand that a lot of the energy has to go into not only on the screen but how that screen connects to the next screen and understanding that digital velcro and how to connect those experiences not only between the screens but between objects between you know relationships between uh, us and our customers is going to be the stepping stone to giving that bear hug to creating that trust and creating that affinity and driving door swing and driving conversion and making lots of money in 2015 so thank you so much uh, that's some books I write and I'm writing another one on the digital uh, the internet everything big surprise <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you so much Thanks.